All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for taking the time out of your day to join this webinar on relational databases. Um, we're really excited to have you on just because there's a lot to say on this topic, and this webinar is not going to uh, even scratch the surface as to what can be talked about with relational databases. Um, but we hope this is going to be a good introduction um, to start thinking about and slotting in additional knowledge that you do get on relational databases into um, an existing framework that we're going to build here. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so before, before we kind of launch into everything, um, there's just some general housekeeping notes. Uh, so the webinar today is going to have two portions. So the first portion is that we're going to be talking about uh, relational databases first. And we're going to be presenting uh, and, and kind of talking to the merits of that uh, in the first section. And then there's going to be a brief period of question and answers um, towards the end. Um, and also, please feel free to submit questions uh, at any time during this webinar. Um, and at the, at the very end, we'll kind of parse through the questions and we'll answer some select ones as well. Also, all of these sessions are going to be recorded. So if you need to drop off, please feel free. Um, we're going to have the webinar recording available to you uh, at a later time to view in your free time. Um, and also to pass on to your colleagues whenever you want. Uh, so great. Let's kind of just get into it. So a quick word about me. Uh, my name is Kenny, and uh, I'm currently the uh, Product Marketing and, and Analytics Manager um, at Looker. Um, and so that's really great because that really gives me an opportunity to sort of learn about all these really interesting topics and distill them in a way um, that makes sense um, for people both technical and non-technical. Um, and the, the where I kind of built that, up that kind of skill set knowledge is coming through sort of Looker's award-winning support team. Um, and, you know, so you, if you can imagine, there's a, been a fair share. We've seen our fair share of database problems um, there as well uh, and database issues. So, you know, and also had to explain those issues to, you know, thousands of, of Looker users everywhere. So this is, uh, is going to be a great time, I think, for, for us to kind of take a step back and, and reanalyze a little bit some of ha how some of these problems and, uh, and what transaction databases are um, so we can counteract them in the future. Uh, I also helped put together the Pocket Guide to Databases along with Daniel Mintz, uh, Lloyd Tab, Looker's founder, and some other really smart people from Looker. Um, awesome. So now let's do a little bit of a recap um, of the course. So, you know, yesterday Daniel talked to you guys about how to think about databases and walked you through some of the major database categories at um, a very high level in the introduction to databases. Um, and so that piece uh, and that webinar is going to function as a great piece of content um, for you to send to people that want to get a better idea around what databases are. Um, and also for you to kind of build in the framework around, you know, how to slot in new information around your databases. He also made a really good analysis about cars. So, you know, there might be some more wacky analogies coming your way here to also help you understand about relational databases. So today we're going to be talking about relational um, or some people call them transactional databases. Uh, and the reason why a lot of people refer to these databases as transactional is because they're actually built to handle transactional processes. Um, so you, want, you can think about transactions as any type of interaction with the database uh, that, that involves basically making changes to or writing to the database. Um, so this kind of involves, and this is traditionally thought of as sort of making small incremental changes and sort of incrementally adding data to these tables. Um, and so the first type of databases were developed around the uh, 1980s, and uh, they were really built to handle the challenges of that day and of that era. Um, but they're also still used today, uh, you know, and so, and not only are transaction relational databases still used in practice today, but they're also probably the most popular and, and, and uh, you know, the database that has penetrated the market the most. I mean, uh, you know, everyone from Uber to Pinterest to Facebook, um, you know, to larger, larger enterprise companies um, use transactional databases, relational databases to kind of write and process their data. Um, and so, you know, that's really a testament to the fact that the problems that they tackled uh, before are really still relevant today. Um, and so, you know, for that, let's kind of take a little bit of a history lesson. And I, I know Daniel talked about this guy, Edgar Todd, uh, before, but he's kind of worth bringing back and revisiting today. Um, so Edgar Codd is really known as the founder of the relational databases for a reason. Um, he developed the relational database model pretty much as a means to separate the machines that stored the data from the applications that used it. And so 
what that meant was, you know, before before he con you know conceived of this relational model of databases, um, applications that accessed the data had to be tied to the exact machine that was using that was storing the data because data was thought of uh, and it was organized kind of like a file system. And so, uh, you know, you really couldn't really change the shape of that data a lot if uh, and you if you want to write an application on it. Um, and so, and if the data did change under underlying you know, the application also changed. Um, and so, you know, what that basically meant was you know, the people building the applications, um, you know, his, his sort of revolutionary idea around the relational database was that the people that were building the applications don't necessarily need to know how the data is organized inside the machine. Um, and that was revolutionary because before you absolutely did because, you know, if you think about, uh, you know, organizing files on your, on your system, you know, on your computer, you have to know exactly where that file is located on your machine um, in order to kind of retrieve that file. And so, you know, this was sort of a revolutionary concept. Um, and it also meant that, you know, there was now a model that abstracted the processes for storing and retrieving data into rows and tables. Um, and so that really paved the way to kind of construct a universal language, um, which is known as the Structured English Query Language or, uh, or Structured Query Language SQL or SQL, um, that really allowed, you know, uh, the next iteration of sort of business intelligence and ushering in that new, that new world of business intelligence to, sp to allow people to start talking to these databases. Um, and so it's really worth noting that, you know, his philosophy, um, you know, his entire philosophy was around attempting to make databases easier and more accessible for normal people. Uh, and these are people that, you know, weren't necessarily sitting next to the giant mainframes every day um, attempting to learn and, and develop relationships with them, right? You know, these were people, uh, these were what we think of as business users now. Um, and, you know, his, his sort of methodology was, you know, how can we make this better to people that know nothing about programming? And how can we make this type of, this type of model better for people that know nothing about data um, or, or accessing data? Um, and also, if that answer, you know, if, if we can sufficiently abstract that process for those people, why would that solution not necessarily be acceptable for application programmers as well? Like, why would they also not want that abstraction and that simplicity? Um, and so, you know, that really led to the creation of the relational databases, relational database. And, you know, it turns out that that was a good problem to solve. Um, you know, so now we're going to do, you know, an introduction to some high-level concepts that you're going to want to know uh, to build this model around thinking about relational databases or transactional databases. Um, and so we're going to answer, you know, a couple of questions here, which are what are relational databases, how do relational databases work, and when do you want to add or switch to a new database? Um, it's also worth noting that if you are a lifelong MySQL or Postgres developer, this is going to be very high level for you. Um, and so we're not going to get into the weeds on optimizing or crazy distribution strategies um, you know, that some of the top 1% um, or 1% 1, 1 of companies or developers are using. Um, let us know if that might be interesting to hear. Um, you know, that could be a great idea for a webinar later. But instead, we're going to be tackling these three high-level questions to help build a, a more conceptual model around what these are. And that, uh, that is, what are they? So what are they good at and what are they not good at? Two, how do they work? So we're going to then dive into three core concepts around relational database architecture and why they're specifically optimized for writing and low latency. And three, you know, when would you want to upsize uh, to a larger or, or, or better database, and for what reasons. So now let's just dive into it. Let's first talk about what relational databases are. Um, so if you've ever worked with any of these databases as either a developer or as an analyst, um, you've worked with a transactional database, and they're everywhere. So 90% of websites use MySQL, and that's just counting MySQL as a database dialect. Um, it's also worth noting that a lot of these um, relational databases are open source. So, you know, uh, what that means, that, th there, that means really two things. Th number one, there's a huge developer community that supports these relational databases. And two, um, there are also many different service providers um, that provide support and licensing contracts for these. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people sometimes 
have this misconception that open source is um, either free or um, you know unsupported technology. That's actually not true, um, especially because you know for uh, for open source technologies like MySQL or Postgres, um, there's actually given how how long they've been around in existence um, and how widely used they are, um, that that developer community is just growing every single day. So. Um, you know, with, with that, let's get into so, sort of what relational databases are really great for. Um, the first thing they are is mature. And, and what I mean by mature um, is I think, I think Marty, Marty Wiener from Pinterest um, in a blog post actually talked about this really well. Um, so first is that there's a lot of talent available for you to harness if you're building on these and you need somebody to help manage them for you. Um, and the way he kind of he kind of illustrated that was if you if you try walking out into a busy San Francisco walkway and yell out that you need a MySQL admin, um, chances are you're going to find one. Um, it's unlikely that you're going to find one for a newer database uh, you know technology um, that is less prolific uh, and hasn't been in the market a lot. So that's the first thing that we mean by mature is that there's a lot of already existing talent and expertise. Um, that you can pull from and hire from um, to kind of manage these databases. The second is a huge developer, it's, there's a huge developer community. Um, and so what that really means is that, you know, and then again, he illustrates it like this. Let's say it's 2 a.m. and you're developing on a, um, you know, on your database and you get this error, you know, you get this really, really weird error. Um, you know, if you're getting that error on a lesser known database, Chances are, if you look for that error, no one has actually ever run across it yet. Um, uh, or if they have, there's not a whole lot of material articles on it and how to, how to troubleshoot that problem. Um, for a more mature dialect like MySQL or Postgres, for example, there's going to be uh, lots and lots of documentation uh, around that and lots of people that have probably already asked, ran into that and asked that question uh, because the trail has been blazed so far um, for these technologies. Um, and then three, the, the third thing around maturity is that these technologies are less likely to break. So because they've been around so long, um, you know, the, the complexities have really been ironed out and the code, the code base has actually become uh, a lot more simple and a lot more robust and elegant. Um, and so that means that you're, you're way less likely to run into standard issue errors with a more mature technology uh, like MySQL or Postgres than you are with a newer technology. Uh, and so that's a, that's a really great, um, great benefit for uh, developing or uh, you know, programming on a relational database. Um, the next thing they are is they're super fast. Um, again, provided that the data volume and the transactions are sufficiently small, right? Um, so, you know, what this means is that they're built for transactional processing, which basically means that they can deliver data and update these tables, the tables that are contained within them very, very quickly. Um, and we'll get into a little bit why, you know, they're so fast in that regard. Um, you know, they're, they're also constructed to be very, uh, to have very little latency um, because these are usually uh, architected to run as production systems, which basically means that the systems that are responsible for um, writing data and serving code, uh, serving data to your users. Um, and so, you know, we'll, we'll get also get into this later on, but a lot of the ways that people, you know, especially companies that are newer, um, start going and getting into analytics around these data, uh, the data that's contained in these databases, um, is that they're going to replicate, uh, you know, the, their production database as a read-only replica. Um, and, you know, uh, when you do that, the, the replica will likely be nearly in sync with the master or the production database um, that you're using. So there's very low latency in terms of um, the data that you can analyze there. Um, and finally, they're optimized for writing. Um, and this, this, this is actually the point that we're going to dive in a lot, uh, a lot today uh, around why these transactional or relational databases are optimized for writing. Um, but basically, the, the thing that you want to know at a very high level is that they're really built to ensure um, the minimization of a loss of data um, in a system that's almost guaranteed to lose data. Um, and so, you know, when you're, when you're using, when you're using these, these transactional databases, um, as you're writing or as you're reading to the database, they're, they're specifically architected to prevent data loss. Um, um, for for your your users and for your system, and if they do, um, you know the the entire transaction will fail. Uh, and so we'll, we'll we'll talk about that a little bit further on down the webinar. 
Um, and so it's for these reasons that these industries tend to lean on them actually pretty often. Um, so, for example, web applications um, are they're really popular as serving as the back end for web applications because they're super low latency um, and there's a high data integrity with writing. Um, and, there's all, and also they're because they're very mature, right? So they're great for people that are building web applications for the first time because the amount of support that they can get online or you know, uh, through, through you know, even live developer communities at their college or, or you know, in their peer group is very, very high. So that's why they're very popular as, as being the back ends for web applications. Banks and retail really like these databases as well um, because these are, uh, th these are systems that are built to handle money, right? And so ensuring transactional integrity and minimizing um, you know, data corruption or data loss here is absolutely key. And also making sure that there's a history of every transaction is very, very key here. Um, and so, uh, and more, and also, you know, uh, banks especially right now are, uh, these are very, very popular because of also the low latency. Uh, and, you know, when you're trading, um, you know, uh, at a, in, a, in a finance context, you're going to want to, you know, minimize latency between, you know, uh, writes to your data and reads to your data as much as possible. So you want to be as close to real time as you possibly can. Um, and finally, the operational monitoring, again, because of the low latency issue uh, and the high data integrity issue. Um, and, and those are the properties that really make them really great for these contexts. There are also other contexts that these databases are great for, but these are probably the most popular contexts that you're going to see a relational or transactional database show up in. Um, so, so now that we've kind of covered what these are, let's talk about what they're not. Um, so relational databases are not optimized for reading, uh, reading data. Um, and so, you know, this basically means that when your databases are kind of you have to prioritize either writing or reading when you're making a database. And I know that the people might comment that there are some databases also that prioritize both writing and reading because they have different architectures. Uh, but what I'm saying here is that transactional databases, um, in, in the way that we, in relational databases, the way that we think of them um, traditionally, are really optimized for write integrity uh, and not optimized for read throughput. Um, and so, you know, uh, so basically, you know, when you're developing on these databases, you're going to have to prioritize one over the other. Transactional databases prioritize writing, and we'll see a little bit why um, in, in just a few seconds. They're also very, they're also not very scalable. Um, and what I mean by scalable is that they're not scalable necessarily for analytics. Um, so they, they're, uh, because they're built to handle, you know, individual one-off transactions, um, they're not necessarily great at pulling massive amounts of data, um, you know, in the form of rows, you know, like, hundreds of thousands or millions of rows of data from their from their internal databases. Um, and so, you know, and also they can't necessarily take advantage of parallel processing um, when making these complex data pools or transformations. Um, it's also, um, you know, again, there are, there are also crazy companies like Pinterest, um, you know, that, you know, have these crazy distributed architectures uh, for, uh, you know, transaction databases like MySQL, but the vast majority of companies are going to run into, um, uh, overhead and uh, and kind of a ceiling in terms of scaling out their database, uh, you know, for analytics when their data hits a certain data volume, and that's when you're going to want to um, upsize to a larger analytical database. So now that we've covered sort of what transactional databases and relational databases are, let's get into a little bit about how they work. Um, and more specifically, this can be thought of as you know why are transactional databases optimized for transactions? The first reason that these are optimized for transactions um, is because they're row stores rather than column stores. And so what we can think of as a row store is something like this. Um, so let's say you have a table full of student data, right? And so you have a couple of columns. You have uh, the name of the student, the GPA of that student, um, the amount of days that student has attended school, and the number of detentions that that student has. Um, a row store is going to store every individual student's record, so their name, their GPA, attendance, and detentions, as one row. So if you can see here, um, that's kind of how I've illustrated it, is that like every single color is going to be stored as one single object. Um, and so what that means is that, that that's actually great because that means that, you know, that because Amy, the, the, the name Amy is attached to a specific GPA, number, which is attached to an attendance, and that's all part of one object, that means that you can never really break them apart. Um, 
when you're writing to them. And so that means that that data is going to be extremely consistent um, when you're writing or updating or reading from it. Um, and so that's really, really great for ensuring a high amount of data integrity. Um, it's less great, though, when you're trying to read from that data for this exact reason. So if you think about it, right, like let's say, for example, you have these four rows. You have name, GPA, attendance, and detentions. Um, and you want to make a poll of only the name and the GPA of every single student. Um, well, remember that, na that, that Amy, Brad, and, Tr and Christy are all one object of their own. So when I'm trying to pull them, what I actually do, when the database actually pulls, it pulls the entire row, and then it performs another operation that filters out explicitly the attendance and the detention column. Um, and so, you know, again, this is three rows of data on a very small table, but like if you, if you can imagine having millions of rows of data um, on very wide tables, this gets to be a very, very big problem very quickly when you start encountering scale. Um, and, so, uh, and so while transactional databases are optimized for high write integrity, they're not necessarily optimized for high read throughput. Um, and, so, and so that's kind of, that's sort of what row stores, that's the, that's the benefit, but also the sort of the double-edged sword of row stores. Um, column stores, again, are, are the exact opposite. They're, they don't have this problem, um, and they're actually optimized for high read throughput, uh, specifically because, you know, with, so while it's row store stores every individual row as an individual object, column stores store each column as a different object. So now the name column is all one object. The GPA column is all one object, attendance is one object, and, and detentions is all one object. So if these are all different objects, what that means is that if I'm, if I'm pulling both name and GPA um, from a column store, I just pull name and GPA. There's no, there's no pulling the entire table and then filtering out those individual rows. And so at scale, this actually is great because it saves me a lot of processing power and a lot of additional operations um, when reading from the database, and especially when having when there's a lot of um, when there's a lot of high uh, when there's a lot of complex operations being performed on this data. So now that we've kind of talked about the first tenet of why databases, or specifically relational databases, uh, have high transactional integrity um, or high they're they're, mon they're they're optimized for writing. Let's talk about another case um, that makes relational databases very great for um, uh, high, write integrity and data integrity, and that's the uh, active transactions or active compliance. And so. Um, you know, what these are are basically a set of guidelines that ensure data integrity or transactional integrity. Um, and what that basically means is that they're designed to minimize or eliminate the loss of data uh, from the database when there's a bunch of transactions being made. Um, and again, you know, this is, this is critical when you're dealing with things as important as people's money or, or people's financial identities. Um, and so, and so these are very, very, these are taken very seriously by developers um, and, and, and database developers uh, entirely. And so basically if the database is active compliant, that means that transactions on this database uh, possess all of these individual properties. And so again, you can, you can imagine this is very important when writing and updating data from the database. Um, and so, you know, here's what these are, atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. Um, and if you've never seen these before, um, these are sort of going to look like science terms to you uh, and therefore maybe not necessarily the most readable. Um, so let's break them down by using you know, something like a fun metaphor. So suppose you're attending a play at a theater and that you know that the tickets are highly contested. Um, you know, and, and actually just because you know, the show is all the rage right now, um, let's kick it up a notch. So let's say that you have exactly one opportunity to buy tickets to the Broadway play Hamilton. Um, and let's say it's your kid's birthday and you really want to surprise them with these tickets and you have one opportunity to do so. Um, acid principles are going to ensure that the playing field is made fair for you against other buyers. So let's take a look at this and, and do a little bit of a deep dive here. Atomicity is going to ensure that you cannot have partially bought your seat. So either the transaction of you purchasing your seat will complete or it will fail in its entirety. 
So every single transaction is tied to a distinct amount, a distinct fa failure or success. Um, and again, you can think of this as going back to the idea that transactions to the database are all written as one object. So either the object exists in the database or it doesn't. Um, or the, the modification to the object in the database exists or it doesn't. Um, and so, and so Atomicity is going to make sure that there's nothing, there's no such thing as partially buying a seat to Hamilton. You either own your ticket or that transaction has failed. So then you have consistency. Consistency ensures that two people can't buy the same seat to Hamilton. So this basically means that if you buy that seat for your, for your kid um, and your family to go to Hamilton, then nobody else should also be able to buy that seat. That seat is taken out um, of the registry, and now you own that seat just as much as you would own a physical, a physical item. Uh, because you do, because it's physically represented in the database. Um, and, so, and so that's really great for making sure that um, you, you know, there's no two types, of, two types of transactions that own the same, the same object, like an airline seat or a material good or you know, a, a, a sum of money, for example. Isolation is also key. Um, so this means that but basically before another person can even think about buying your seat, your transaction process to process that seat has to fail. So that means that, and you'll see this a lot with ticket sales, for example, when, you know, uh, for example, you're in the middle of, you know, completing or filling out uh, a form that allows you to buy a ticket, um, let's say to a concert or an airline, it'll say something like, you have 30 minutes to complete this transaction. Um, because what they want to do is they want to make sure that nobody else is, is, is looking at or buying that seat um, until your transaction has either completed or, ha or, or when it fails. Um, and so that's really important to make sure, uh, again, that there aren't a lot of simultaneous writes to the same object on the database. And finally uh, is durability, which is arguably one of the, uh, you know, one of the most important features of of active compliance, which is basically, let's say that you're buying your seat to Hamilton and the entire database or the entire data stack fails um, and the database goes down, um, uh, but let's say you've bought your ticket already, right? You want to make sure that you still own that ticket even after the database comes back up. And the way that they do that is they have um, what's called a transaction log, and that's basically a list of every single update that happens to the database. And so when the database, for example, let's say if, if the database has to fail or it needs to be restarted or rebooted, for example, um, what that transaction log is going to do is it's going to, uh, it's going to allow that database to read every single transaction and make those edits to the database, the database tables as necessary. Um, so what that means for you is that even after you bought your ticket, there's nothing that's going to stop you from owning that ticket short of you issuing another transaction to sell that ticket. Um, so the database, even if the database fails, if the website fails, um, there's always going to be a way to restore um, and bring back into line this idea that you've bought your ticket to Hamilton. Um, and so again, it's these properties that are very, very important for ensuring um, data integrity and, and making sure that we don't go crazy when we're, when we're trying to do interesting things like buying tickets to our favorite shows or making a deposit of large sums of money. Um, and so these really keep the world spinning on its axis. Um, and so the third, the third thing that we're going to talk about today is replication. Um, and replication is really, really important uh, because of this really big problem that um, transactional databases have uh, when they're used as production systems, which is you can't read and write from the database at the exact same time. Um, so, and that makes sense, right? So if, you're, if, you're, if your database is is updating a certain record, um, you know, if it's in the process of making a, an update to a record, you should not then be able to pull that record from that database. Um, and again, there are, there are a lot of ways that databases have evolved or innovated to handle that, this problem. But the most common way that, that a lot of developers um, and a lot of um, analysts and companies have solved this problem um, is basically by replicating the database. Um, and the most popular form of replication that, uh, that you're going to hear being talked about is master-slave replication. Um, so this really t uh, deals with two things. You have the master, which you can think of as your production database, or the database that people are going to be, that is going to be writing and updating your tables. 
you then replicate that database and, and, uh, and make another separate clone of that database that is called the slave database. Um, and so what, what basically happens is data is only flowing in through the master database. Um, and so only the master database updates the tables, but as soon as tables are updated in master, that information gets pushed to the slave database and that slave database also gets uh, updated as well. And so this happens very, very, very quickly. And so this is why, this is how production databases have very low latency. Um, you can contrast this with other ways that, of thinking about data warehousing, for example, um, where data from a production database must be transformed, it must be moved physically to another database, uh, uh, you know, and it must be piped through a, a, you know, either into the cloud or otherwise, um, which introduces a certain amount of latency in the, into that system. With master-slave replication, there's very low latency because there's really no transformations that are being done, um, and the data isn't really moving. Um, and, so, and so that's really important to note, um, you know, when you have a, a uh, you know, when you want to introduce very low latency into your, into your analytics and system. Um, and this is important, too, because you can have as many slaves as you want um, for, for master-slave replication. It doesn't necessarily have to just be one. Um, and so, you know, what, what that means is that you can, you can then distribute your data um, and have many different people reading from these, these individual read-only replicas or, or uh, slave databases uh, while keeping the master as, a, as the production, as the right, as the, uh, the one kind of right database. Um, but of course, this introduces another problem, right? Because even, even if you've used, you know, master-slave replica, uh, master replications to introduce read-only replicas into your data stack, you have another problem, which is there's still a single point of failure, which is the, the master node, which basically means if the master node goes down, um, you know, your entire, because that database has been used uh, as the uh, as as the database that is writing to these other these other read-only replica databases, um, if that database fails, the entire system fails. So a way that companies also um, and data engineers also prevent this from happening is that they use another form of replication called master master replication. Um, and so what that means is that you have individual uh, you have instead of basically cloning the master and making a read-only replica, you have, you clone the master and, ha and make a read-write replica. So that basically means that both of these individual master databases um, are able to write data to that database. And so that increases, of course, the amount of write throughput um, to the database because now you have not just one database that's writing, but you also have two databases that are able to write um, back to each other. Um, and again, those databases will then, you know, update each other as to new transactions that are coming in, um, and, uh, and so they will both be kept consistently up to date. And what that basically means also is that you can provision one as being the primary, and then the other one as being a read-only, uh, you know, and, and reading pretty much exclusively from that, but if that first one fails, if the, if the initial master that you're provisioning as production database fails, you can easily promote this other one to be, to be a master uh, as well. Um, and so to, to basically promote a high availability with your data. Um, and so again, you know, you can have as many masters as you want um, in this system. Um, you know, this is kind of an example of how, uh, of how uh, you know, a lot of companies do this. But the thing that you also have to know is that with master-master replication, um, there, there is, introduces a high amount of complexity. Um, so the more, the more, you know, in the, like rights you have, you know, you might have more availability uh, and durability with your system. Um, but the problem is, of course, is that there's going to be, there's just more moving parts here. Um, so those are the three kind of major components of transactional databases, and it'll allow you to kind of read a lot more articles around transactional databases and kind of understand what they're saying. Um, so now let's get into the final portion, um, which is, okay, so these sound great, right? Like, relational databases are awesome. Um, why, do, why do companies switch up and use other databases <clears throat> for their analytics? Or, you know, if I'm using this, uh, only a relational database right now or a read-only replica for my analytics right now, when would I want to switch up um, and, and maybe provision an analytical database for my analytics? So the first one, again, is when data volume begins to scale. Um, and really, this one, this one needs to be in conjunction with the second point, which is when data volume begins to scale and when you start performing more robust analytics on your data. That's important because um, 
production databases and relational databases are designed to scale um, to handle more transactions, but they're not designed to scale to handle more reads. Um, and more robust analytics. So if you start doing lots of subqueries and lots of more advanced analytics on your on your large data set, you're going to hit some performance thresholds um, very quickly. Especially when your data gets into you know the millions uh, or the you know or in the terabyte level um, uh, of your data. Uh, and so so when you have more uh, when you start doing more complicated analytics on bigger data sets, it's it's going to be more necessary for you to um, provision a dedicated analytical data database or data warehouse um, to handle those more complicated those more complicated uh, uh, operations and processes. Um, and the third point here is really when people in your company begin to work with data. So when more people in your company and when you want to take advantage of um, you know, massive parallel processing, which is the ability of a database to handle more than one process at one point and handle more than one thread at one point, um, that's when you're going to want to think also about using a, a, a more powerful database for your data. Um, so again, if you have, if you have, let's say, one developer, you know, or one analyst that's making, um, you know, very simple analytical pulls from your transactional database, then you might be able to get by with only having a, you know, or only using a transactional database for your analytics. But if you start, you know, maybe taking analytics, you know, and and kind of taking it uh, a, a step further by, you know, um, uh, making more operational analytics, building dashboards on top of your databases, and things like that, um, it's likely that you're going to want to take advantage of, um, and especially if more people are using that an that analytics, it's likely that you're going to want to take advantage of um, a, a more, uh, a massively parallel processing database, which we're going to talk about on Tuesday. Um, and so that kind of concludes the, uh, the, this webinar on transactional databases and relational databases. Um, and so to, uh, on Tuesday, December 12th, we're going to be talking about analytical databases and specifically diving into um, massively parallel processing technology um, around those databases. And we'll talk about you know, how, how these databases have um, solved this issue of having high read throughput um, on data and also kind of diving a little deeper into um, massively parallel processing architecture. Um, and then, of course, Daniel is going to come back on Thursday, December 14th, to talk about the future of database technology. And so he's going to sort of talk about where the market's going and, um, you know, what we can expect from future innovations um, that, that might be just on the horizon. So with that, we're going to start taking, uh, we're going to start taking questions. Um, so... Uh, just so basically right now, um, if you have any questions that you didn't have a chance to submit um, during the webinar, we're going to take, you know, uh, about two minutes to submit questions and, and read through them. Uh, and then we'll take the rest of this webinar to kind of go through them and, and answer them. Um, so while we're doing that, I'm going to kind of talk through a little bit of resources um, that you can use um, to, uh, to get a little bit more out of transactional databases. Um, and also, if you want to examine some more uh, resources uh, and or examine more of these databases um, on your own time. So the first is the Pocket Guide to Databases, which is, again, um, a resource that is provided by some of the data experts at Looker um, to, uh, uh, to, get, to basically give you a better idea of how to work with databases. So the, uh, the first one, uh, so the way that we, the reason why we kind of conceived of this is we had um, an idea that databases weren't necessarily super accessible to people that were curious about them. And the reason why is because most of the resources on databases were um, either one of two camps. They fell into one of two camps. The first camp was, you know, documentation, right, which is this super complex, um, very complete uh, narrative around databases. And then the second, the second, um, the second kind of material that you would get around databases would be something like a marketing article, um, something that would would talk through through some like three key points around databases, but wouldn't really necessarily get into the weeds. Um, and so our sort of 
desire with this was to kind of create something that was a little bit in the middle of both of them, right? Something that didn't necessarily go all the way and talk to, and talk to you as much um, as a piece of documentation would, but also wouldn't necessarily go back and, and talk to you at the level that like maybe a, a traditional article on marketing would. Um, and so we're trying to really hit that kind of middle ground. Um, and so if you have any other feedback, if you have any feedback around you know, how we're talking about databases um, or on this webinar or on the pocket guide, please feel free uh, to submit us uh, at databases, uh, dot looker dot, databases at looker.com um, and, and that, that will get right to us. Um, you can also email us at discover at looker.com with any questions around this. Um, and then of course you can request a, a demo of Looker, uh, a platform that is actually designed to work specifically and leverage um, some of these larger databases, um, you know, relational, analytical, Hadoop, um, you know, you name it, uh, and, make, and really make them work for you and your users. Um, so, you know, with that in mind, um, you know, we're going to get into some questions. All right, so we're going to take a look at some of the questions here. So the, the, first, the first question really is, you know, um, talking about, it, it really, it's really asking about these hybrid databases, right? So, you know, there are databases, there are databases like MemSQL, um, Oracle, for example, um, and others that, uh, that, are, that are really billed as both analytical and relational databases. And so, you know, um, it, they're, really they're asking, SAP Han is another one, right? They're, so the question is really asking, where do those fit in? Um, and the, the answer really is that they fit into both. So a lot of these databases, what they do is they, they have, they store data in two different formats. They store them first in a, um, a row, oriented format that is optimized for transactional processing and, o and OLTP, um, and they also store them in a, uh, in a column-oriented format um, where they can access, where analysts can access OLAP, right? And that's really important, um, you know, because that means that the data really never has to move, right? So even, even in a scenario where you have something like um, you know, master-master replication or um, master-slave replication, the data is going to be moving a tiny bit um, to be, just be cloned from one database to another, right? Um, with these data stores, um, like MemSQL, Oracle, um, SAP HANA, um, et cetera, the data never really moves because the data store, the data storage layer um, and the transaction and the, and the, and the layer that, that actually processes that data are going to be different. Um, and so what that means is that the data never moves, and so that it approaches just real-time data a lot, more, a lot faster and a lot quicker. Um, cool. And so, um, awesome. And so basically another question that we have coming, coming in um, is, you know, around, you know, the, the, the use of Hadoop and kind of where Hadoop fits into, um, you know, transactional and relational databases as well. Um, and uh, Daniel covered this a little bit earlier, um, but kind of Hadoop is its, is its own animal to some extent because, you know, it uses sort of a different processing framework called MapReduce to process the data. Um, and so that's going to be a little bit different than how, you know, or, you know databases like, um, you know, Redshift, BigQuery, or Snowflake process the data because they use, they take advantage of max parallel processing principles, whereas Hadoop uses MapReduce. And those two have definitely been um, uh, those do definitely influence each other, uh, absolutely. But it's the way that Hadoop uses data um, that makes it a little bit different. Because instead of data being stored, you know, in like a relational format, like in a traditional relational database, you're going to have data stored in um, Hadoop distributed file system, which is kind of more similar um, to something like a NoSQL or like a, a blob storage bucket, like. Um, S3 or GCP or Google Cloud Platform, for example. Um, and so what we actually need to do in order to make that data queryable via SQL um, uh, is kind of implement some kind of relational storage engine um, like Presto, uh, Spark, Impala, or Hive on top of that that kind of it takes that data from HDFS and schematizes it, which basically means put it into a relational format that can then be queryable and talked through by SQL. Um, and so that's going to be sort of the difference, the difference there. Um, 
And so, yeah, this has been this has been great. Um, you know, if you have any other questions um, for the the webinar as well, um, please feel free to, to um, you know. Uh, send us a question or a note, um, either uh, databases at Looker.com or discover at Looker.com. Um, we'd, be more, uh, we'd be more than happy to kind of answer your questions. Um, and definitely keep on the lookout for uh, the uh, next Tuesday where we'll be talking and diving deeper into massively parallel processing technology um, and analytical databases. So thank you so much.